Good morning. All right, perfect. Question letter I says, draw the dot structure for N2O. Certainly, this would not be a test question, but this would be a test question in normal school. So therefore, it's still good practice for us. In normal school, we don't go so fast. In normal school, we get more days of this. And so a question like letter I becomes more normalized. But in distance learning, fast paced learning, trying to cram this all in at the end of the year, a problem like this can't be on the test because we just haven't had enough practice over and over again. So let's not worry if you don't understand what it is that I'm about to do. They tell us that in the dinitrogen monoxide, one of the nitrogens is the central atom. You might notice that pretty much every single time that I do these problems, I put the central atom in blue. And then I put the other things in either pink or black or one of the other colors, just so we kind of see like a pattern to all of this as it's developing. So if this nitrogen in blue is going to be my central atom and I want to start attaching them, um, I'm going to use red for my lassos today because I'm probably going to actually erase these lassos after I put them on here. First thing I would do is I would start lassoing electrons that are near each other. I would lasso them together like so. But now what our issue is, is where do you go with the last of the nitrogen electrons? Do you go with the nitrogen or do you go with the oxygen? Because at this point, nobody here is happy. Not one of these elements is happy and has its octet rule satisfied. So one thing that students like to do is they like to, and this is such a logical thing to do as well. Remember, don't copy the red because this is not the right answer. They want to attach these two and then they want to attach these two and they end up with a nice looking little triangle of, I don't want to draw it because I need to use the back button to erase all those lassos, but they end up with an NO, NNO kind of triangle looking thing. There's no such thing in chemistry as an element or as a molecule that attaches into some kind of structure like that. They're always based on a central atom and then things that come off of the central atom. And like chains, like I said in the email, uh, chains pretty much only occur with carbon. And then even still, they never really go around and come back together again, except for like one exception is benzene. Benzene has six carbons that sit around in a ring, but everything else, they change. So there's always a central atom. So as logical as this answer seems, unfortunately, it's not correct. But have no fear. If on a test you did that, you would still get a lot of points because this isn't all or nothing chemistry. This is all about you showing some chemistry skills, even if every once in a while the skill is not correct. Here's what actually happens with these two and, or these three. And so what I'm going to start by doing is I'm going to rearrange where my electrons are. Remember, one of the rules here, which is the hardest rule in all of high school, is using an eraser. People hate using erasers. They want to try something, and if they're wrong, then they want to give up. In a math problem, if you can't solve the math problem, you quit, right? Well, unfortunately, this is an area of chemistry where a lot of times the first attempt isn't the best attempt. I'm going to erase this electron right there. I'm going to erase this electron right there, and I'm going to move them. I'm going to put the blue nitrogen electron over on this side. And I'm going to put the pink nitrogen electron over on this side. And then I'm going to start lassoing and I'm going to lasso these electrons, these electrons, and these electrons so that those two nitrogens are in the same triple bond that any N2 ever would be in. When we did nitrogen earlier this chapter, which you probably don't remember it, we had a triple bond between the two ends and then the other two unshared pairs were sitting off to the sides. Now, this is not a very common form of a, a nit uh, nitrogen oxide, is to have N2O. It's not stable. And the reason for this is because oxygen is doing something kind of strange here. So I'm going to get my eraser back out, and I'm going to take this electron. Mm, either It doesn't matter which one I take off of there, because my picture is kind of all over the place anyway. And I'm going to put the oxygen electrons in three unshared pairs. And then what the oxygen is going to do is it's actually going to attach itself to those two nitrogen electrons like that. I would imagine that there's people sitting in this room, people sitting at home who are like, how would I ever come up with that on my own? Which is why this is not on your test because a problem like this one really requires the practice over and over again 
that leads to being willing to make mistakes and then fix until you get it right. Honestly, I don't even think they put dinitrogen monoxide on an A2 chemistry test, just because that's a confusing one to come up with. But here's what they would do. They'd put it on an AP chemistry test or a honors chemistry test. Diagram is already given, right? So if we see this on a test, let me erase this one more time. I'm gonna change that pair of electrons to just a line instead. Because now I can ask the questions. How many shared pairs? How many unshared pairs? What's the name of the shape? And is it polar or nonpolar? And these are skills that a chemistry student must have, and you will be tested on on Tuesday. Anybody interested in shared pairs, unshared pairs? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, oh, I just got a hand up. Go ahead. Uh, for uh, I. Uh -huh, for I. Four shared pairs, four unshared pairs. Good. And then I'm going to add into that linear and polar. So linear because it's straight across uh, with no extra electrons on the central atom. I need to explain that a little bit better in a moment. And then polar because it lacks symmetry because it's not the same things on both sides. Color? Any? Question letter J. Yesterday I went to K because it was straight across from it and didn't really recognize that J and K uh, actually are uh, alphabetized in a different order than that. Um, Question letter J says, draw the dot structure for the SO3 molecule. So I started by putting my, um, my game pieces down onto the paper. And you'll notice that I already cheated this one ahead a little bit. And that is that instead of drawing the S's and the O's with six electrons where I put two singletons, I already grouped them up as groups of two, okay? The reason for this is because it's very common for oxygen to grab onto a pair of electrons on the central atom like so. Oxygen is so electronegative and it needs two electrons that it doesn't mind just doing what we call the notes, a coordinate covalent bond where it borrows the two electrons from the central atom. And so that's what happens there, okay? But we're not done because sulfur doesn't like to be electron deficient. So what sulfur is going to do is it's going to actually, or one of the oxygens is actually going to allow a second pair of electrons to go in and form a double bond with that sulfur. And so we end up with the central sulfur double bonded to one of the oxygens, single bonded to another oxygen and single bonded to another oxygen, all right? Uh, this too would not be on a test. If it was on a test, it would already be given as a picture like this. Uh, for honors chemistry, it would be given as a picture that includes the extra unshared pairs of electrons. In AP chemistry, it would be given without the unshared pairs of electrons, and then they would ask you to list how many unshared pairs of electrons. In other words, they're saying, here's what the picture looks like. You need to now take the puzzle and figure out that picture so you can figure out how many unshared pairs of electrons are present. Some people don't need to do that. Some people can just look at this without the dots on there, and they know by how many clouds. So let me try this, since I know that I have some AP chemistry people in this class. Let me just start by showing you how you would guess the number of unshared pairs. Remember that you wanna end up with four, you wanna end up with four sets of electrons around an atom. So if you look at this oxygen up here, right now it's got one shared pair of electrons. So if it needs eight electrons, that tells us that what's missing from it is six more electrons, three unshared pairs. Same can be said about the bottom oxygen, three unshared pairs. Now, when you look at this oxygen here, it's got two sets of electrons in a double bond. So there's a double bond, two shared pairs. Therefore, it already has four, it needs four more. So if we're gonna put four more on here, that means it needs two unshared pairs to give it the eight. So see how you could do that on AP, multiple choice question, especially after weeks of practice that you'd be able to figure that out pretty quickly. Sulfur, because we see a total of four lines around it, it has its eight electrons already, okay? Shared pairs, unshared pairs, name? Good. 
Very good. It's trigonal planar. When you have three things attached to central atom with no unshared pair there, you get something that's flat as a pancake. Trigonal planar. Very good. That's exactly right. And it's nonpolar. And there's one more thing we can say about it is that it's a, what's called a resonant structure, which means that this double bond can actually jump between the three oxygens there and uh, move around. Uh, color? Question letter K up here in the corner. Is there stuff missing? Yes, there is. There it is. Um, draw the dot structure for the SO2 molecule. So if we're going to keep that same thought process of what I just did for J, let's do the same thing for K. So instead of me drawing the electrons separate, I'm going to go up here and I'm going to put them in as three pairs of electrons. I can't see my colors, so I'm stuck with, I guess I could minimize this. Do I really need to see the picture of all of us? It won't let me get rid of it. Try that again. What? The second one? You know, I've only been doing this Zoom all year. You'd think I'd know all the rules, right? That one? Won't do anything. Maybe it's this. Doesn't uh, Zoom won't let me. I think I can see those electrons right there on the last oxygen well enough now. Definitely people at home can because the, the box, they can put it wherever they want to. They don't need all this stuff. Anyway, that's what I'm going to do. And then exactly like we just did for J, our lassoing of electrons is that the oxygens grab onto uh, the sulfurs like that. But we still have to have a double bond because the sulfur only has six electrons around it. And I just want to repeat one more time, and really more than one more time, because I'm going to say the same thing about L. These are not test worthy. These are the kinds of questions where the picture would already have to be given and then you analyze the picture rather than you have to come up with it yourself. So if anybody's out there feeling a little bit of fear and trepidation about this, please let's uh, uh, alleviate that. Okay, AP chemistry students, to be able to guess how many unshared pairs are still on each of the atoms is that right now this oxygen here has two shared pairs in the double bond. So there must be two sets that are still missing. And sure enough, we can see them right here in pink. This oxygen over here, because it only has one shared pair, must have three unshared pairs. And sure enough, we can kind of see them right there. The sulfur in the middle has three shared pairs in a double bond and a single bond. So therefore, it's missing another unshared pair. And sure enough, there they are right there. Anybody interested in... Uh, Shared pairs, unshared pairs, shape name. Ooh, now we get to make a comparison. I think this is why when I was doing this yesterday, I went out of order. It was because of the fact that I and K actually go better together without J being in the way. Takers, go ahead. Very good. Exactly right. Yes, kind of. The only thing, though, is that the minute that you go into the bend, mm -hmm. you automatically lose symmetry on a horizontal axis. So when we see this shape like so, that ruins the symmetry because it drops things below the, the cross the line there. Okay, but very good on bent. All right, so here's for us at home to make sure that you guys catch this. This was a, a very thoughtful discussion we had yesterday as well, which means that people are having trouble with this. How do you know when it's linear versus when it's bent? Because if you look at these two pictures right here, hopefully you guys are paying attention. We're looking at this picture and we're looking at this picture. How do you know when they look the same that one is linear and one is bent? And the answer to that is look at the central atom. If there's no electrons on the central atom, the molecule is going to go straight across and be linear. If there are any unshared pairs on the central atom, they force the bonds to go down into an angle and it becomes bent. The minute it becomes bent, 
it becomes polar because it lost its symmetry. If it can stay linear, it's got the choice, but the only way it's going to be nonpolar is if both of the other elements there attached to the central atom are the same thing. Those are the rules. you got to know them on Tuesday. Polar. Question letter L says, draw the carbon monoxide. We've all heard of carbon monoxide. We know that there's such a thing as carbon monoxide poisoning. Maybe we want to also understand why after we see this molecule. So to put this one together, um, start with my lassos here. I would lasso these two electrons together and I would lasso these two electrons together. And the minute we do that, the oxygen has satisfied its octet rule. You cannot lasso any more electrons or you now ruin oxygen. Oxygen cannot hold more than eight. It's the best octet rule element that there is. So how do we now make the carbon, which only has six, get its eight? We have to bring in a pair of oxygen's electrons and make a triple bond. And so what we end up with is carbon triple bonded to oxygen. And then these two electrons, we'll just put them by themselves over on the backside. And these two electrons, we'll put them on, alone on the backside. Why is that toxic? Because you have something inside you called hemoglobin, and hemoglobin is what transmit or transports oxygen to your cells in order to do respiration. The problem is hemoglobin doesn't really recognize the difference in these two, even though chemistry recognizes huge differences. This is polar, uh, but its size is very close to the same size, and apparently it's the size is what hemoglobin is attracted to, not the polarity or whatever else. Now, I don't know much more because I'm not a biologist. You'd have to ask maybe Mr. Alberto to find out more information about that. But um, it's toxic because it replaces something that's crucial to your survival inside your blood. Any questions on this slide before we move to better questions for your chapter test? All right, these two for sure could be on your chapter test. So make sure that you pay attention as we go over these. These would be, I know, these would be ones that you would actually get where you have to do the complete drawing. Nothing would be given to you. So the first thing is everybody must know how many electrons to put in the dot diagram. If you don't, you're really going to hurt my feelings on the test because how many days in a row have we said, okay, chlorine, column 17, seven dots. Sulfur, column 16, six dots. So on your test, if I see absurd things, it's going to hurt my feelings, all right? So when I'm grading your test, I'm just going to make sure I have a copy of my paycheck sitting there so I can look at my paycheck every once in a while and remember, oh, yeah, that's right. I get paid for this. So please, let's not hurt my feelings. Let's, let's not even think about money. We do this because we all love chemistry. This is an easy one. When you go to lasso, you're going to lasso together the singletons like that and lasso the singletons like that and you're done so now the question is unshared pairs and shared pairs that's easy you're going to get that right but the bigger other big question is what's the name of the shape and therefore with that shape name does that make it polar or non-polar um, bent Good. So it's bent. The minute it's bent, it's polar because bent is always polar because bent lacks symmetry. Color? Oh, good catch. Got throw. Question letter N says do the same thing with the silicon dioxide. So silicon comes from column 14. 14 means four dots. And then this one's an easy one. We're just going to start lassoing electrons until we have everybody satisfied. Now that oxygen on this side is satisfied. Check mark. The silicon is not. So now we'll go to this side and we'll lasso electrons as well. And what we end up with is silicon double bonded to oxygen and double bonded to oxygen. I know it feels weird when. Yeah. Um, it has four pairs of two electrons and two bonds, and it has four pairs of and it's linear and it's non-polar. Very good. 
Okay, time for a rehash. Why is letter M bent and letter N linear? Has to do with the fact that there's no unshared pairs of electrons on the central silicon. Therefore, the bonds will seek maximum separation from each other by going straight as a line right across and it's linear. Whereas up here, these unshared pairs of electrons force the two chlorines from being straight across to going down a little bit in order to seek maximum separation from the other unshared pairs that are there. And so we get bent. The minute you get bent, you get polar. If you're linear, you may be polar, you may be nonpolar. In this case, you're nonpolar because of the perfect symmetry of having oxygens on both sides. Color? Lots of purples now. Yeah. Uh, do they take, oh, no, there's still lots of lots of reds there too. All right, keep moving. Question letters uh, O and P are also not test worthy as you making them, but if I give them to you as drawings, that you could still be able to analyze them. So uh, when you go to put together the O3 molecule. Uh, I've already got my three puzzle pieces up here. I'm going to start um, doing my lassos. And right there, when I lasso those, I'm done with the oxygens on the left and the middle because they both have their octet rule satisfied. So it would make sense that the molecule O2 is probably pretty stable because two oxygens can take care of their uh, octet rules by just bonding in a double bond. But you can't just make up the rules. If there's another oxygen here, we have to somehow bond this to it. So the minute that I see this issue, I'm going to erase one of those oxygen electrons, move it to the top like so, and then my lasso this time is going to be this oxygen grabbing on to a pair of electrons from an oxygen like that and making something that's not very stable. This is called ozone. Everybody in here has heard of ozone. What's special about ozone? Well, it's instability means that if it gets hit by ultraviolet radiation, it'll actually break apart and form regular oxygen, which is a good thing because then ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun gets absorbed in that ozone layer that sits above the earth and it allows for things to be alive there. Otherwise, probably the earth, I wouldn't say the earth would become sterilized, but it certainly would have affected uh, light, okay? Not as much as what the, uh, what's it called, the Van Allen belt? No, that's probably not the right name. I think it's Van Allen belt. It actually deflects cosmic radiation from getting to the Earth. That's actually more important. That's caused by the Earth spinning. Well, basically we're a large spinning electromagnet and that causes cosmic radiation to deviate away. And that's why up in the Alaska, they see the uh, Northern Lights. The Aurora Borealis is that deflection. Good stuff, huh? Yeah, I know. Uh, shared pairs, unshared pairs? Name the shade. Good. Why bent? Right there is why it's bent. And because it's bent, it's polar. That's a resonance structure, which means that, that double bond can flip back and forth between the two oxygens. Um, but that doesn't matter. Uh, we're not testing you on resonance structure. Color? Yesterday's person that answered all the questions in physics, uh, we had a bunch of other things available that for the price of five jolly ranches, they could buy, you know, so I can get tickets at, at uh, Chuck E. Cheese, they could buy things. So you, know, you already cast it up, the one with the Paw prints, and then the second ones I found a flashlight on the way to work. So there was a flashlight that was for sale too. But he took them both. He traded in like 10 or 12 Jolly Ranchers for a flashlight and a tchotchke. So I'm sorry, I don't have anything else right now. I don't know. Let's, you know, get you some chemistry equipment if you want, maybe. Students break it enough that there's always replacements. So, you know. All right, question letter P, three iodines, the triiodide molecule. Here's a perfect example of one that people want to make into a triangle. You can't do that. There's always a central atom. 
So we pick one of the iodines to be the central atom, and then we start lassoing. I'm going to lasso right here, and then I would say I'm done. Because why would iodine want to have three? Iodine wants to have just two. That's why it's one of our hanophical brides, is it feels stable with just two. So how do we end up getting three? How on earth are we going to attach this one to that one? You can't do it unless you do one thing. This plus sign here tells us that we can remove one electron. So remove an electron from somewhere on here. I'm going to take away this one. This is my choice, but you could take away any one that you want to. And then now our lasso says, let's put these two together. And we have our triiodide. Looks pretty linear, doesn't it? But it's not. Go ahead. Bent again. And because of the unshared pairs, it puts it bent. Doesn't matter if it's one unshared pair or two unshared pairs. All that's going to do is possibly affect the angle, but we don't care about that. On the AP test, they just ask, did it affect the angle? And then you need to say yes. Uh, and then all of this could be put into brackets if we want to. Does polarity matter? I had a person ask me about this in the emails too. Why do you keep asking, does polarity matter on just certain questions? If you notice, there's a, there's a pattern that every single time I ask, does polarity matter? It's on the ones where it has a charge here. So that you'll say no, because polarity is like those really crappy magnets that your fifth grade teacher had. Remember those ones that barely stuck to anything? But then when you got to seventh grade science, all of a sudden your teacher pulled out a neodymium magnet. And if you weren't careful, the two neodymium magnets should actually smash your fingers when they came together really hard. Okay. So what a neodymium magnet is, is it's kind of like an ion. They're such strong magnets, whereas polarity is more like the weaker magnets. And so once you have something that's a strong magnet, you bring a neodymium magnet next to a bar magnet, they're going to stick together really hard but not because of the bar magnet, because of the neodymium magnet. Does that analogy make sense for talking about ions versus polarity? I hope so. Not that it matters so much for this year. Are there any questions on homework four? All right, review time. Now, some of you did the review already, and you will be rewarded for that when it comes to your test. But a lot of you haven't even looked at it yet. So instead of me just jumping straight into this and answering it for you, let's give you a chance to answer the problems ahead of me. You could start with numbers one and two. I'll be right back. So go ahead. If you think you something to work on, you can work on numbers one and two if you haven't done homework. You're on, you're done and you need to go run off some energy, feel free to just go run up and down the hallway a couple times. Yeah. Or well, can you take a nap? Take a nap. Four hours. Did you say that's not good? Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at your age, there's absolutely nothing wrong with getting eight or nine hours of sleep a night. You can use it. It's good for your body's repair. Homework or video games? None. None? Just didn't just didn't sleep. Mm -hmm. I have a nephew that gets up at 3 30 every morning to get down the hill for work. And he'll text me at like after nine o'clock. What the heck are you doing now? Go to bed. While you're thinking about your answers to question number one and two, I'm actually going to start the electron configuration for nitrogen right here. And maybe we can use the configuration for nitrogen. That's a colon there. That's not the dots for nitrogen. So let's get rid of that. Uh, I'm not going to put anything. I'm just going to put N. 
And then over here, I'm going to write down the electron configuration, which is 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. And by the way, this is on your test, the very first question on your test. I'm not going to give you the element. I'm going to give you the electron configuration. And I'm going to ask you to tell me how many valence electrons it has. And it was amazing in yesterday's class how many people really didn't know what that meant. And I'm not just talking about people sitting in the room. People at home were asking me questions too. They actually did a very good job on their review yesterday. And I think that some of this stuff kind of escaped them. I didn't really leave myself much room to write here. So um, I'm going to just squeeze in a nitrogen right here. And that's the nucleus of the nitrogen. And then I'm going to draw some energy levels around this nitrogen. like so, and then I'm going to put some electrons on it. 1s1, 1s2, 2s1, 2s2, 2p1, 2p2, 2p3. There's your Bohr model of the atom that shows what uh, we did first semester to talk about how the electrons are arranged, okay? Now the question says define valence electrons. Maybe we could define valence electrons by telling me how many valence electrons, Joseph, it looks like you might want to answer that. Five. Uh, five, very good. The valence electrons are the ones that are in the outermost energy level. The valence electrons are the ones that are involved in bonding. So the definition of valence electrons is the ones on the outermost energy level. Sure, yes, anything like that would be fine. And those are the ones that are involved in bonding. So on your chapter test, you're going to see a configuration. I'm not going to tell you what element it is, but of course you could look it up because you can just look at what its battleship position is to figure out who the element is, right? So 2P3, you just go find what element's at the location 2P3. But you do need to tell me how many valence electrons. So how about let's pick all of these. So nitrogen has five valence electrons. Now, what is the nitride ion? The nitride ion is N negative three and its configuration is 1S2, 2S2, 2P6. If most of us weren't at home right now, I would have played a joke on you right now. You wanna hear a funny joke? Is when I wrote that down, I would have said in all seriousness without actually uh, flinching, I would have said 1S2, 2S5, 3P3. And then I would have just kind of stopped and looked around, right? Very innocently, like I was busy doing something else, waiting for somebody to say, wait a minute, you can't have two S5. Exactly, you can only have two electrons in the S sublevel. So therefore what we have to do is put the three extra electrons for the nitride into the P sublevel. You may be hated doing these little boxes things. I don't know why, it's not like it's that hard. But the boxes were for us to visualize this because the box for the 2s can only hold two electrons. The three boxes for the 2p can hold a total of six of them. But originally it only had three. So why does nitrogen want to form a ion if it does form an ion, which is very rare. Nitrogen usually just likes to share electrons, okay? Well, because it will feel more stable if it could put electrons here, here, and here. So that's why we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Uh, color, Joseph? Yeah. I'm going to do questions three and five, and then we're going to use questions three and five to explain number four. So how about we'll start with number three? Use dot structures to determine the correct bonding between sodium and oxygen. I don't know if you want to just tell me what the chemical formula is. You could probably guess it based on how many things I drew up there. Anybody interested for their very own piece of candy? NA2O. Doesn't this kind of make sense that it would be Na2O? I'm not using lassos this time. You all hear this? I'm not using lassos this time. I'm running a football play. Here's my football play. This electron, oh, that wasn't the right color though. I still gonna use lasso color. I'm just not gonna circle. This electron goes to here. This electron goes to here. And what happens is 
we end up with two sodiums that both have a plus one charge. And we end up with one oxygen with a negative two charge. And that gives us the chemical formula Na2O. Okay. So now let's go down to letter F. And let's just for the sake of argument, let's rewrite this as F2O. Okay. Don't those two things look alike? Na2O and F2O? Yet they're completely different. So now we need to explain why. That's where we had a super big discussion. I was so thankful to uh, Sarah Sieberling about this because she wouldn't let up. I mean, she was just attacking the chat about asking questions for this. And I love that because that's telling me somebody who wants to understand why there's a difference. First of all, color. All right, so we're doing number five right now. Draw the dot structure, what name the shape and the polarity of OF2. So we start last one. Hey, this makes a great test question. This is totally fair because this one here, for you to be able to lasso those two electrons together and lasso these two electrons together and be done with making your with making your structure, that's fair. That's fair for a test question. If you can't do that on your test, then you deserve a bad grade on your test because that's a simple one. And everything about that is simple. Everybody must be able to do that, okay? So you end up with oxygen bonded to fluorines like so. And of course, we could name the number of shared pairs, unshared pairs, but instead we're going to skip right to naming the shape. Anybody interested in telling me the name of the shape of the molecule? It's Ben. Is it polar? Yes, because bent is always polar. Okay, did you all hear that? Bent is always polar, even if it's the same two elements on either side. It may look symmetric to you right now, but it's not symmetric because the actual shape of it is bent. And that loses its symmetry on a horizontal line axis. So therefore it's polar. Now, how come I didn't ask you about the name of the shape for number three? How can we only ask you for the name of the shape for number four, for number five? Because number three is not a molecule. Number three is a ionic compound. So what's the difference? Okay, maybe we need to go to the internet for this one. Uh oh. I got tight. I don't think I can type with this. I know I can't type with this. Um I doubt they're gonna have oh uh any oh what's up? Chris Crystal. Lattice of Na2O. And it's probably not going to be there, but we'll try it. It could have actually had it somewhere in there, but I think I'm just going to look at this picture right there just to talk about. Of course, it's hidden behind the, um, the chat. I'll click on it again so you can get the bigger one, but it'll probably try to sell it something. Yeah, throw money. Not how it should be that teachers would have like a hat sitting out here and students should put money in the, in the hat. I think. You ever notice that? That you go to a restaurant and a person who just takes food from a counter and puts it on your table, you guys give them a tip. I give you an hour's worth of knowledge, I get no tip, right? Uh, let's see. Who do you get Christmas presents for? I remember when I was a kid, we used to actually put uh, like a six pack of beer out next to the trash for the trash men when they came because, you know, back then they actually had to go out and pick up the trash can and pour them into the thing and whatever, drive on. So you give them a present. And that's just for them taking away your trash. Do teachers give you an hour's worth of, of, of knowledge every day? No presents, no tips, no anything? Isn't that interesting? We can all see that picture now. What is the difference between a molecule and an ionic compound is that picture right there. How are you going to name a shape of this 
Everybody at home can see this right now. Sorry, I was talking near the computer so you couldn't hear you couldn't hear me. How are you going to name a shape of something when there are 2 billion sodium ions for every 1 billion oxygen ions? You don't. We call them things like simple cubic, uh, body-centered cubic, face-centered cubic, hexagonal closest packing because of the fact that this is a lattice it's a lattice of billions and billions and billions of atoms. But what we're looking at here in OF2, that's a single molecule. Even if you have billions of these molecules, each molecule is separate from the next molecule over. And so therefore we can talk about them as individual molecules and talk about their shape and all of that kind of stuff. You feel better for knowing that? So what's the difference between them? Well, I just gave you a good difference. What are some other differences? Boiling temperatures. It turns out that to take an ionic substance and boil it, it requires super, super high temperatures. How are you gonna turn salt into a gas? You know where they turn salt into a gas? No, they don't. They just turn it into a liquid. You know where they turn salt into a liquid? Anybody ever driven to Vegas? On the way to Vegas, you go down that hill, but you're already looking at state line way up there and you're going, wow, state line, I can't wait to get there. Then you take a quick look to the left and you're like, what's that? Ooh, it's really bright. And it looks like a sea from all of those mirrors that are out there. And in the center of the mirrors, there's the queen that sits there in the tower. What's in that tower is just basically a big, huge cauldron of salt, table salt. And those mirrors are all pointed at it. And what do they do to the salt? They heat it up so hot that that salt turns into a liquid. Okay, exciting, isn't it? Yeah. Now, how do you make electricity out of that? You, you heat water. What does heating water, how does heating water make electricity? It can't. You know how you make electricity? Are we in a hurry? Is anybody having fun right now and prefer that I actually show some neat things? How do you make electricity? There's two ways. Number one is you can use a chemical reaction, but the problem with chemical reactions is they require a lot of energy to set them up and you usually only get them one time and it's hard to reverse them, but you can't. But there's another way to make electricity which is much cheaper. Light bulbs, proof of electricity. Wires, how we supply electricity to the light bulbs. A um, eye wash station, a place where we can do demonstrations. What just made electricity? Mechanical energy, right? My arm just made electricity. How I did that? Those of you at home, hopefully you can see that okay. If you can't, then you should come to school. Um, what I just did is I turned a coil of wires inside of a magnetic field. And by doing that, it induced those wires to all of a sudden move electrons in it. So I used mechanical energy to create electrical energy. It's by far the cheapest way to make electricity. Has anybody ever driven to uh, Palm Springs? What's all over the place in Palm Springs? Wind generators. You know, those things that our previous moron in chief said uh, kill birds, which there's no dead birds around all of those uh, wind generators. Um, wind generation is by far the best way to create electricity. It's cheap, super cheap. But we can't do it because in a place like this, which has a bunch of old white people, they won't let us put wind generators up on the mountains because it'll ruin the view, right? Yet it will save the planet while we ruin the view. So we don't have them. But some people have them. Some people have them at their houses or if you live out here like in where it's San Bernardino County. Great way to make electricity. So how does boiling salt, which has a high boiling temperature, uh, not boiling salt, liquefying the salt, create electricity? 
Oh, good try. Excellent try. Excellent, excellent try. It's actually even simpler than that. You take that hot salt, really, really hot. You run it down through some pipes next to some water. You cause the water to boil. What does boiling water create? Steam. What is steam? Well, yeah, true. See, that's something that you could say too. See, you got great ideas, but there's, see, there's cheaper ways to do it, right? So what does steam do? What do you do with steam? Come on, what did, they, what did Mr. Uh, Smallwood teach you about uh, the 1600s? The Industrial Revolution? What's that? Steam, okay, steamship. So how does a steamship work? What's the steam doing? What is, what's that? You're now getting on the right idea. So the steam creates pressure. What the pressure does, turns the handle. What if you use steam pressure to push on this handle to get it to spin? Now you just create electricity, a free way to create electricity. So by harnessing the solar power up there near Vegas, they melt a ionic substance, which is very difficult to do. And then that hot ionic substance passes thermal energy into water, boils the water, creates steam pressure, and then you've got electricity. And then that water cools down because of, as it does work, it loses heat. And then you take the water and you cycle it back through next to the salt again. The salt that lost heat to the water, you cycle it back through up to the top of the um, tower again. And the solar power heats it up again. Don't you feel smarter now? Should you go home? See if you can go home and explain at dinner tonight to your parents what I just explained to you. See how well you could do. Because once you can explain it, you own it. Right? Once you can explain something, you own it. So go and try it. We all having a good time still? You guys miss miss the fact that you didn't get to see all that from at home? They probably are all ghosting us now. They all walked away. Dot structure for, this is called hydrogen peroxide. Everybody's heard of hydrogen peroxide. Here's your dot structure for it. So this is an example of something other than carbon that will change, but it's very rare. Yes? It is H2O2. Because uh, the structural way of writing it is HOOH, right? But you're right. It, the chemical formula for it is H2O2. Hey, that should be worth something. Color? All right, so here's how it works. Actually pretty easy once it's set up like I have my picture here. Sorry, my lasso got twisted. Went the wrong way. There it is. So now you're like, well, what shape is that? Is it happy face? Because it kind of looks like a happy face? Well, it turns out that really what it is, is around one oxygen, it's bent. Then around the other oxygen, it's bent. Okay, so we don't really have a name for that. They would just say, what's the name? What is the general shape around oxygen number one? They probably call this like oxygen number one and oxygen number two. And you would just say it's bent around oxygen number one. This makes it polar because it's polar, it dissolves in water, which is why if you look at your hydrogen peroxide container at home, it's going to say like two or four percent hydrogen peroxide. It's 96 percent water. Well, how do chemists and scientists figure out what shapes matter? Ah, good question, huh? I'm going to put it on the next slide while we answer that. Uh, and like, how do they know like the degrees of it? Too? I know, it's crazy, isn't it? Uh, it's a bunch of smoke and mirrors. Do you know what that means? Whenever you don't have an answer for something, you fake it, right? Mm -hmm. Smoke and mirrors. So, like, a magician knows that they can't actually make the bunny disappear, but they can fool you into thinking the bunny disappeared with smoke and mirrors, right? That's what chemists do too. They do hundreds of thousands of experiments with things that are so minutely small that they can't be seen, that those experiments then lead them to coming up with a theory. Then when they come up with a theory, then they do hundreds of thousands of experiments to try to prove that theory wrong. Not try to prove it right, prove it wrong. And if nothing can prove it wrong, the theory gets accepted. Or really it's a hypothesis that then gets accepted as a theory. So how do we know these shapes? because all of the experiments that have to support why water is polar 
would have to support that somehow the hydrogens are offset. They're not straight across. All right. So what are the examples of the I don't know. I'm just a high school chemistry teacher. Are you kidding me? They probably showed us all that stuff when I was in college. What was I doing? I was sitting here going, oh, God, I only got four hours of sleep last night, and I drank 12 beers, right? So then you don't, you don't learn anything. But my first year teaching than I ever learned in four years of high school and college learning all of this stuff from very smart people, right? One of the smartest people I've ever met in my life, her name was Dr. Butcher. Can you imagine that? Your last name is Butcher and you're a chemistry professor. I mean, how scary when you go, well, I'm going to go to my class with my professor, Dr. Butcher. This isn't going to be a good year. Well, it turned out to be a great year. Extremely intelligent, very uh, good teacher that I uh, would definitely go, hey, I regret that I did not maximize what I, my knowledge in that class. Like all the stuff I just told you earlier that maybe somebody was kind of like, yeah, I'm not really paying attention. Years from now, you go, how did those solar panels work? Right. Um, fortunately, the difference between now and then is that you have Google, the vast source of information. So, you know, if, if you reach the point where you finish your homework, you've got nothing left to do, you've already lost on your video game, there's nothing good on TV, you don't want to read. Hey, Google, what's an experiment that helps show a shape of a molecule? Because, like, for example, the question. Why is it that all the reference materials show this as being five bonds to the central phosphorus rather than, or really not five, but five cloud or five sets of electrons still in only four clouds? Why did they do that? Because they know something from experiments that says that the bond lengths are not represented by single length bonds or represented by 1.25 length bonds which means that they can actually kind of get an idea of how far apart the O and the P are from each other. Now, how they do that mostly, I think, is they use refraction. The way light reflects off of something, they can tell bond lengths from that somehow. How they do that from that, I don't know, but that's just what they're going to use, okay? But, you know, someday when you're a famous research chemist, you'll have all of those answers, right? Somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to do it, and it's needed. If you don't have research chemists, you don't have research biologists. If you don't have research biologists, we don't have a vaccine for COVID right now, right? So this stuff is, is it's all interrelated. And a company, as much as I hate big pharmaceutical companies, thank goodness for them because they're the ones who hire all these people to sit in a room inventing something that's not needed because in the future it might. And then all of a sudden, we get hit by a pandemic, they make billions of dollars because they were willing to take that chance. Well, that seems pretty fair to me, doesn't it? You know? Why do compounds with high intermolecular forces have higher boiling points than those with weak intermolecular forces? So I use water as an example. What happens with water is because it's polar, it has a slight negative charge down near the oxygen and it's got a slight positive charge up near the hydrogens. That's the Greek letter delta. It looks like a sigma because I'm not writing them very well. That's a better one. Oops, I put a negative there. Uh, these are attracted to each other. That right there is like a one of those bar magnets, kind of weak. But if you pick up a bar magnet with another bar magnet, it'll lift it off the ground, right? Whereas these are like just two pieces of iron that aren't magnetized. If you take one of these and try to pick up one of these with it, it won't pick it up, will it? So these don't stick to each other very well. So they'll only stick to each other if you really cool them down, cool enough to a point where they'll start to stick because they're not moving very fast. So therefore they have very low boiling points and melting points. These have higher boiling points and melting points because they want to stick to each other. They're called intermolecular forces. This big phrase here is so overly tested on the AP chemistry test and really all it's just talking about is this, stickiness. Yes. It, it's it's really a static electricity. It's the same way that like uh, you open a plastic bag and maybe like the or like, here's a good example. You you uh, want to put a band aid on, right? So you take off the plastic off the band aid and you're going to put the band aid on, but you can't get that stupid plastic thing off of your hand, right? That's basically what the molecules are doing. It's static electricity. Phosphate. Last one. Lassos. One, 
two, three, doesn't work. Because now you're like, well, what do I do? I've taken care of my phosphorus here, but how do I now take care of my oxygens? Well, depends. Yesterday I did this in a different order. Yesterday I put the three uh, extra triangles that we have because of the negative three, I put them on the central phosphorus and then I just made coordinate covalent bonds. Today for you guys, because I wanted, I could see that you guys wanted something a little different. I'm going to put those three extra electrons here, here, and here. It sure does. Okay, that one we have to do. And that's why I did it that way yesterday is because then it makes more sense. You're right. I only put three. I'm not sure why. But it's an easy fix. There's number four. So doesn't that make more sense from what you saw on the internet? Because on the internet, there was a double bond. They're telling you that this comes in here and forms a double bond and three single bonds because phosphorus can actually sometimes carry more electrons than it needs to. And experiments with re with refractive indices prove that they're do that it's doing that. See how I threw all those extra big words out there, the smoke and mirrors, so it kind of threw you off. You're like, refractive indices? I don't know what he's talking about, but that sounds pretty like high tech, so I'm just going to leave that one alone. That's what teachers do. We just throw big words out there so people go, hmm, they must know what they're talking about, right? Which I don't. I honestly don't. I have no idea why phosphorus would want to do this because in the kind of chemistry that you learn in high school and general classes in college, you would never, ever throw another pair of electrons in there. That's done just like that, and it worked perfect. It was a perfect puzzle to put together. So why did they have to wreck it? Because some research found that there's a double bond floating around inside of there for some reason because phosphorus is breaking rules. We don't like rule breakers. We like everybody to follow the rules. All right, we're done. Uh, I was going to go over homework number three, but you can see here that I never really had a plan to go over homework number three. Um, it's not going to be on your chapter test, so therefore let's not worry about the polyatomic ions, which means also number eight is not going to be on your test. Um, you need to make sure that you can do questions like this one. Number five, sorry, I don't have the pen out. You got to be able to do question number five. You got to be able to do questions one and two. Uh, and I think there's going to be three questions like number five, one question like number two. Okay. Any questions at home? No 8.3, unless you want it. But I think I already put the answers on the uh, slides, so you can look them up. And then if you have any questions from those answers, just email me. Go over number four, this number four, Aiden, right here. Yes, you would email me uh, the review so I know that you're listening. Uh, difference between ionic bonds and covalent bonds. Number three is an example of an ionic bond. They actually give and take electrons. Number five is an example of a covalent bond. They share electrons. The effects that this has, ionic bonds have high melting and boiling points. Covalent bonds have relatively low melting and boiling points. Anything else? I'm gonna stop the recording.